Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 392. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Whalen, Dr. Norge, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim. I'm a little worried right now because Sean posted on Facebook that I torture monkeys. So <laughs> says the sensei of the whatnot, Segulin, and the Duke of you know. Hey, I am very simian friendly here. That's the one thing I want to make sure people realize. I love monkeys. They are awesome and they rock. <laughs> On this episode, uh, we're actually going to be talking about the movement issue number 12, the final issue of that, the Batgirl annual number 2, and Batgirl number 31, which is where a lot of the intro came from on there. We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network, the League of Comic Book Podcasts, and the DC Infinite Podcast Partnership. Sponsoring this episode is DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Over at DCBService.com, you can pre-order the Futures End event with books like Action Comics Future End, Aquaman Futures End, Batgirl Futures End. All of these titles are available in a standard edition and a 3D edition. The great part about DCBService.com, they have a micro site that they sent up right now that you can click on and make decisions on which versions of the books that you want to order. And it's great if you like want to pick up a few titles that maybe you're like, I want to pick up more of the Futures End event. I don't want to get every one of them in 3D. You can pick and choose which titles you want to get and save some more money that way. All of these issues are 40% off. So it's a difference between paying like two thirty nine, for example, or one seventy nine, depending on which version you're buying. So it's nice if you want to mix and match and, and save some money that way, but read the titles. I want to thank DCBService.com for being our comic book pre-order source. Over at InStockTrades.com, we're talking about Batgirl and the movement on this episode. And they have the Batgirl Wanted uh, hardcover, volume four, which collects Batgirl 19 to 25, Batman the Dark Knight 23.1, The Ventriloquist. And it's twenty four ninety nine regularly fifty percent off only twelve fifty. They also have the movement trade paperback volume one, which collects issues one through eight of this really cool series, written by Gail Simone by art by Freddie Williams. Fourteen ninety nine regularly forty two percent off only eight sixty nine. Remember, orders of fifty dollars or more give you free shipping, and that's instocktrades.com. Mister Segulin, what kind of a podcast are we? Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on the show. So, if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. No monkeys were harmed during this podcast, although some of them might have hurt their ears during that. So, <laughs> without further ado, let's talk some comics. You filthy criminals. Our first discussion will be on The Movement, issue number 12. The writer is Gail Simone, artist by Freddie Williams II. The colorist, interior, and cover is Chris Sotomayor, with letters by Carlos Manguel. Cover by Stephen J. Segoba, with assistant editor Kyle A-N-D-R-U-K-I-E-W-I-C-Z. Editor Joey Cavalieri, and group editor Matt Idelson. I was really, really excited for this issue. One of the things that I really love about Gail Simone's writing is she knows when a series is coming to an end or a run's coming to an end that there are fans who are really devoted to the series. They really have loved every single issue. Does a really nice job of, because it's got to be really hard when you've put the effort into creating such wonderful characters such as this. And I mean, this for the whole creative team. That you know, you create these characters. They've got strong identities. They you start to bring them to life. You get to know them, um, which is we do that as readers, but they do that as creators. And then you find out that like it's coming to an end. When they do an issue like this, like they wrapped up a lot of stuff in the last couple issues with Burden, who's a character who I've really enjoyed. And I was really glad that they did that because it showed a lot of... And Mouse. They even did some things with Mouse that we, we kind of were hoping to see with <laughs> yeah. Mouse. You know, it was kind of a love letter the past couple issues to the fans of the series. Um, some closure for them. I love this. I'm a big fan of this. Nothing irritates me more than when I've been really digging something than to just be dropped out of it. At least in this case, we have 
what I think is just, I would have no hesitation of recommending these 12 issues to somebody who never touched the movement and saying, this reads like a great maxi series. It reads like a great 12 issue maxi series where you're going to get to really know these characters and get really invested in them. In the end, you're going to be demanding more just because that's what this felt like for me. It felt like they really went out of their way to write a love letter to the fans. And there was a lot of metaphors in there. Like I had this dream about, you know, being, you know, we would be there a part of the justice league and all that. And, and that so resonates and speaks to the fan in me. Like I love playing MMO video games with superhero characters because that makes me feel like I can be a part of that world. If that makes sense. So I was connecting with reading this in the sense of saying, you know, that's isn't as fans as little kids straight on through to today. You want to be a part of this world. You want to believe that it comes to life. So when we see these characters come to life in other media, not just comics, but in TV shows and film and games and all of that stuff, there's an opportunity to somehow invest yourself more to become a larger part of that. That's escapist fiction. That's what that's all about. And I thought this issue really captured that for me so much. I, I felt like they did throughout oh. the entire ride. Oh, God, yeah. This was, you know, I so wanted this book to continue on and to grow and to get, because you, you talk about just how we did get these great endings, but, you know, with like Burden and Mouse, you mentioned, and I'm glad you mentioned them because issue 11 was an absolute wonderful story where we finally, we really got the good history and understanding of who Burden is, what he's about. And it was really, I was glad to see, yes, we're learning, we're not going to be walking away without this, you know, with this great unknown. So everything is getting tied up. Everything is getting connected and it's being told within the story. So it's not like it's, you know, rushed. It's not like it's, you know, oh, let's just quickly throw out a thing in it. No, this is a detailed story it's still being told. And it's still something that you can, you can see the love and the, the passion that the creative team and i do say creative team because one we both love gail simone's writing but beautiful beautiful artwork working into conjunction with wonderful writing makes for just an absolute true just joy and this was something that i was i'm I'm sad to see it go i love the issue but i'm you know it's that that bittersweet where it's sweet that we get this great issue still but it's bitter that you're like no i I want more. Yeah, we got the story, but you know what? Let's get the next story. I want to see Mouse's second date. I want to see <laughs> how he deals with you know other situations. I want to see you know, Burden's first date. You know all these different and it's and I do find myself thinking the personal side as opposed to also the hero side. I do want to see them kick some butt. I do want to see them fight some big baddies and throw down and say this is who we are. We are the movement, but. It's that personal side of the who behind the scenes with the characters that I want to see more of and I want to get to know. And that's, I think, in 12 issues, I'm locked into who they are. I admire a lot what they've done in 11 and 12. With uh, You mentioned pacing, how nothing felt rushed. I don't know how you do that the way that they did. And they did such a good job of it. I don't know how you do that. Because, you know, basically a lot of the threads that are being tied up in 11 and 12 are things that were intended to be re- built long term down the road you know what i mean yeah and i loved that this felt for me very fluid you're right i didn't feel like there was anything that was short changed or rush i wanted more exactly like you're saying but i also felt very satisfied and that's hard to do i really greatly admire that i don't know how this fits into the i can't pretend i know behind the scenes how this fits into the original game plan with what they're gonna do for the characters I also love that in issue 12, we start off very similar to how we started in the beginning with Mirrors and Virtue. That was, I mean, bo- I'm a big fan of bookending, where you kind of take us back to where we started. Feel like, wow, look at the growth that has happened. A lot has happened in this book in 12 <laughs> issues. So you see these characters, their relationship has evolved. You start to see what their backstory is together, how everything that they've gone through has helped them both reach a greater understanding, not to say that they're on the same page. I quite liked that, too. There was still that thing there between them where they had to clearly compromise to even have the conversation, but that compromising actually shows, too, that there's a bond that has grown between them over this time span through the areas that they do understand each other. I love that. I'm a huge fan. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. And it's you, you do get to see that these are two good people. And with all the corruption that is in the police department, uh-huh. you know, this is a good cop. This is a decent person. It's not 
he he is one of the good guys and he recognizes okay she's one of the good guys as well and it's that you know that understanding and acceptance and especially by the end of this issue you really see those two you know it's a coming together those two but the one of the things that I absolutely got to just again rave about is you get this really cool dark alley scene where the the conversation starts and then you flip the page and you get this double page spread of this super giant mega superhero fight that was her silly little dream of them fighting alongside the Justice League which we all have that dream in our head but I loved how it went from that dark alley to this boom flash of color and bright sequences with multiple heroes battling and it was just i was like oh that's cool just going back and forth and just looking at the details that you get in this uh, cd alley but then you get the details in this cool mega superhuman fight that never happened i was like that's that's the kind of stuff that i was like damn this is awesome you know what i liked about the dark alley and i'm going to jump right to what you're going to too it was tender a lot of times it's hard to bring about tender and make it mean something because we're so used to the big bang and splash and all that kind of stuff. This whole sequence was very soft and tender. And it was it was cool how you do that in a dark alley. You know what I mean? There was there oh, was God, not yeah. there was no bang, there was no explosion. A lot happened in those panels. There's six panels there, and a lot happened in those six panels to bring about a certain sense of emotion, a tenderness, almost a bittersweet tenderness in those moments. But then you're right, you flash to this double page spread. Ooh, did I love seeing this team kind of have their dream sequence? Because it was a dream I wanted to see come to fruition as well. I love the sense of hope when you turn the page and you see the whole team, you know, kind of sitting there. I, I liked seeing, like, looking at them with virtue in the front and the whole team kind of standing there together. I, they felt good. You yeah. know, this is a team that I would love to read more of and see go further. And this is the experimentation that I think is necessary in comics. It can't always be your most well-known characters. Don't get me wrong. I adore every one of them. Like, their whole background, they got four characters that I adore in the background of that. They got Batman, Green Lantern, Superman, and Wonder Woman. I'm adoring all of them. So this isn't a knock on them, and I don't think there has to be a choice. I need characters like are present here in the movement to make the universe come to life because they would inspire this. And you would have this group that would say, hey, don't forget our part of the world. Don't forget our concerns. We can be inspired by you, but we also can criticize you, the areas that you miss. And we can stand up to do something about that. There's something about that. You know, it's not just being ambivalent and saying, well, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, and Green Lantern will take care of all that. We're going to rise up and we're going to start our own movement because there's an area that you can't possibly touch. You can't possibly have concerns about. That, to me, is the whole theme of this book. It's it's the little things. They aren't little things. They add up, obviously, with how big this series is. But this would be what goes on here would be under the radar of our traditional heroes. I love that part of the book. There's an aspect to it. And then it keeps flashing back to Virtue and Mirrors again with those tender moments. There's such an interesting pacing and balance in this issue through um, the dialogue and through artistic storytelling of really taking us through a nice mixture of emotions. Because I wa- at this point, I really wanted more of the Virtue and Mirrors story, which is really important to me. Oh, yeah. And you talk about just how it's the little stuff. It's yeah, I call it... I call them like my gutter heroes. They're mm-hmm. not, I'm not knocking them saying they're in the gutters and scum, but they are just that, that side stuff, that little, the, the quote unquote little crimes that you need to have in this universe. These smaller cities like Coral City. This isn't Metropolis. This isn't Gotham. This is Coral City. And it has its own situation. It had its own dealings. And I like the fact that we had this level of hero that was fighting from the streets and for the streets and from the people. And, you know, it's that – it's the grassroots type of campaign, but it's not even – I don't even – This could do, this could be Euclid. Yes, this could very easily, you know, be our hometown. This could very easily be Cleveland. This could be everything that, you know, and we could be, I can, to be honest, I could see us going, yeah, let's sign, I'll sign up with the movement and being one of those people who put on the mask and, you know, maybe play with a couple rats. I don't know. But, you know, it, this is the kind of stuff that would appeal to people like us and to people who we have, like, 
you want to do what's right. You want to do what's good. And like, how do I do this? Hey, here's how you do it. So if we are living in the DC universe, I could very easily see us a part of the movement. I would say it's more Euclid than Cleveland. Let me explain why. This feels more street level. It feels smaller. Don't get, and Euclid's a big city. It's not a Cleveland, but it's a bigger city. I could see it falling in this category versus um, Cleveland being more like a smaller metropolis and things like that. This feels more street level, more... I, I don't know if I'm making sense in what well, I'm saying from that. I guess that's why I threw that out. Maybe you disagree. I, I think that's an interesting conversation. See, and for people who don't know, Euclid is the suburb Sean and I grew up in. It's an east side suburb of Cleveland. Mm-hmm. And for me, I think... I would say that Coral City would be Cleveland, and the tweens where they live in is Euclid. Okay. That's how I would see this because, you know, Coral City itself is a is a pretty big city. And Cleveland, you know, is a good-sized city. It's not New York. It's not L.A. It's not any of the, the, you know, Chicago or whatnot. But it is a major city. And Coral City is a major city, but it's not this big, booming metropolis. It's not New York City. It's not, you know, whatever. So, you know, so that's why I see the comparison in that way, because they're operating out of one of the smaller suburbs or operating out of one of the, you know, the boroughs or however you look at the city uh, landscape. It's this smaller section and you got to get down and dirty and you got to get with the people in in those neighborhoods and in those type of little smaller cities. And I think that is how and again, it's one of the reasons I kind of associated and got really comfortable with the, the movement when I started thinking that way. See, I was thinking more, and you don't have to agree with me on this. It's kind of like, it's interesting how he saw it a little bit differently. I was thinking more Coral City, Euclid, and the tweens, like Richmond Heights. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And and I, But as you were kind of explaining your rationale behind it, I'm like, I'm nodding. I'm going to go, no, no, he's right. It's That uh, works too. Uh, it's, it's interesting how I think there's a relatability, which I think is really the message by that. I think there's probably a lot of people who are listening to this that were fans of this book that related it to their own towns, you know, or or own surroundings. And that's why these characters, they're street-level characters. There's something important to that. There are lens into this universe. It's an accessibility point that's there. This is kind of like what Animal Man was for me. And it's one of the reasons why I'm glad that that book graduated to be kind of um, the Justice League United, which we are going to talk about a little later. It's, you know, I liked what Lemire did there with that street level Animal Man character. He felt, um, he felt like you could hang with him. These characters you felt like you could hang with and get to know. I felt like I would have arguments with some of them. (laughs) (laughs) You know, there would be, if if you're lucky enough to eventually become um, a part of the group. And I say lucky enough because even though they went through horrible things, I think there was a bond that formed between them that, um, I think you and I can relate to with our own friendship group over the years. You know, I mean, there's been, you know, people that you know you can rely on and trust and will be there. You'll butt heads from time to time and stuff like that, but you bond together when it's the most important. And that's the message of this book. It's what I found so charming about these characters. I really loved the Mirrors virtue relationship because I think we all had so many adult mentors growing up. I'm going on through, you know, high school and not just not I'm not just talking about parents because we all had great parents. Um, but it's also we had a lot of people. I remember in high school, there were so many people that were there that were adults that were mentor figures. And uh, there's something to the relationship between Mears and her where he's trying, even though there's that uh, there's that problem between them, he's trying to reach out. He's recognizing that she's been running away from herself. He's trying to get her story because he knows that certain things are adding up and certain things aren't. He's trying to fill in the puzzle pieces to know what that is. Just that whole story, seeing what happened to her and the fact that this is something that she inherits as a part part of her family. This is something that has separated her from other people. It just... Uh, I, I just really related to the outcast nature of virtue. Because there were lots of times in my life where I felt like an outcast. I think we all have those periods. We talk about that on the show from time to time. And I think you relate to that when you see this character kind of find herself. Because she's clearly at a point now, un- very different from the beginning. Not that she wasn't together in the beginning, but wow, is she in a different place now than she was 12 issues ago. 
and you think about it, it's funny how her name's Virtue, and that's the character. And but it's also is a very definitive, you know, statement of who she is and mm-hmm. what she's about. Because I'll tell you right now, if I had had half as trouble with the childhood as she had, I wouldn't be so nice to people. I wouldn't no. be looking to help and raise up, fight for the little guy. I would be just mad at society and just hate. I would be just a ball of hate, you know, and I would use those powers. And I'd be one of the people that the big name superheroes were fighting, you know, as opposed to being the person who would fight, you know, want to fight alongside the heroes, you know, and the fact that she was able to take all this, you know, this massive amount of issues and burdens as a child that she had to deal with. All this, you know, stuff that just piled on top of her and bam, bam, bam. All this, it's, it wasn't just one little problem. It was multiple things kept hitting her from different sides. And she's able to take that and become a hero, become a champion of the weak. It is an actual very statement of her personal virtues and her personal, just her inner strength. And it, again, that was sort of like, dang, that's cool. I related to her story when, like, you saw her getting like bullied in the playground and stuff like that. I grew up an awkward, nerdy kid. <laughs> like, <laughs> I did in elementary school. I was a complete and total dork. Um, I still am, but I mean, <laughs> I guess I'm more secure in it. <laughs> but I relate to those kind of stories where you see that. Uh, I certainly didn't go through a lot of the junk that she went through, uh, but it's something when you see people, I think we as fans of comics a lot of times can relate to that to varying degrees because <laughs> typically people who are drawn to this medium have gone through some form of a feeling like you were out left out somewhere. Uh, yeah. and, and I don't know what part of your life it happens at. It's very different for every person. That's very personal. But I think that is something we relate to, people overcoming uh, and you know what? I wouldn't. I wouldn't just relate that to comic fans. I would relate to the people outside of it who maybe have never given the media a chance. I think everyone in their life goes through a time, whether it's a short period of time or a long period of time, where you're trying to find yourself. Sometimes more than once. Um, I can know for myself. I've gone through that more than once. <laughs> but I think that that is the relatability of these characters. Sometimes, sometimes their mask is what helps them to find an identity both in and out of the mask, which I think we see with Virtue. There was a lot of hope in this issue, which I really yeah. liked that ending. I really felt it was an ending that left me feeling very hopeful. And that is hard to do, I think. A lot of smiles, like from Virtue, where she's kind of inspiring her team. Uh, the whole thing with Margaret, uh, which you were <laughs> alluding to earlier, and you're so right, to see... Um, <laughs> Hey, this is Margaret. She works at the pet shop, and she loves rats. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and she brings him cheese. Yeah. You gotta love that. You know? my, my favorite bit: of, say hello, mouse. Hello, mouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, little funny moments like this. Mm-hmm. It's these light. You know, it's the lighthearted. It's the fun. It's the his just a mouse as a person, as a character. Just yeah. he's so like, oh, geez, uh, Tremor. I'm in love with a girl named Margaret now. I can't love you anymore. Try to forget mouse. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> you know? And it's this mouse moving on. And you, it's I. Again, I was I was like, dang, that's cool. I wanted. <laughs> I, wanted that. I so wanted to see you know how mouse handles dates. <laughs> yeah. I wanted this for him, though, and I'm glad we got it. You know, I mean, just yeah. an opportunity for him. To, I think there's that's where I'm saying there's an interesting balance here of just recognizing, you know, there's people that were invested in these characters. Let's give them a, a ending where you can feel these characters moving on and continuing on, but with a sense of hope. And I, I think there's something really, really important by that, you know, with certain characters, like Mouse in particular. <laughs> you hit Mrs. Fiddlemore. She's my favorite. <laughs> oh, and every one is his favorite. Absolutely. I, I, I always love it. crack up every time he does that. And it's just the way Mouse is. This is my favorite. No, this is. And it's not a it, – it's not like a scatterbrain, but it is that that animal style to him, that thinking that, you know, because, you know, my understanding is that mice don't have really, or rats or any of those don't have really long-term memories. They don't have that long-term stuff. It's not, you know, they look at life as this is the moment, this is the moment, this is the moment. And I love the fact that the character has that mindset, has that styling to him. Cannon and his son, the cornea killer, and seeing that wrapped up 
the way that it was. That was another thread that I'm glad that they ra- you know they put it all together and wrapped it up for us into a nice little bow because they were the main foils of this series, and I wanted to see where that went. I loved that there were times where I was sympathetic to Cannon, and there was times where I wanted to smack him upside the head with a brick. Yeah. Uh, and and there's something to that. I was it, that was an emotional roller coaster for me because there were periods of time where I'm like, okay, you know, Cannon's being genuine here. I don't know if you felt that way. Not you know the part where it's my son miss is the cornea yeah. killer, and I need you to capture him for me before he kills again. The head down, I. The artwork swerved me. Really, really great job. I, I'm totally going to admit that. I was totally sympathetic to Cannon in that moment. Not to say that I was discounting any horrible doings that he'd done before. What I was looking at there is, okay, in spite of who he is as this you know gangster guy that we've seen him on in, in the previous issues, he's right now sucking it up and saying, look, I, I, this is hard for me to do. Uh, last thing in the world I ever saw myself doing, but I need your help with my son. I thought that's where this was going. Uh, Totally swerved me. Oh, completely. And even like the the panel before that, he's like, for the love of God, don't you people know anything but fighting? Uh And he's the voice of reason, the rational of peace. And I was like, what? Like, and even they're like, what are you talking about? It's like negotiation. I was like, oh, cool. Okay. And I was in my head as this is going through, I felt bad for the guy. I'm thinking, okay, you know, maybe this is going to be like financial sponsorship for the movement. And that's how they're going to wrap up the series where it's not just a street thing where they'll actually take, you know, use some of his investments and use that to help people and this. And, and I had all these mindsets going, but I'm thinking he's going to help them out. I wasn't thinking any type of swerve or anything out of it they they, again just like you i was completely in the okay this is going to be kind of cool i like that i like being swerved in those circumstances when it's good storytelling that's really swerving me um who's the thing of catharsis yeah um cartharsis or however it's pronounced Uh, i so see her as what i would love to see in a new 52 our earth hawk girl i know that they they did a, a hawk girl story arc inside the new Hawkman series. Right. But if they did another one, I recognize what's going on Earth 2 and I love it. But I would love to see something done. She actually in many ways is my, this Earth's you know, Hawk girl to me. Because yeah. the way she carries himself. This is exactly what I think that character should be. I like that her brute strength and you know the whole sword play and everything, it's not all that she is. And that is really important to me. I'm glad that the character did, I know we've mentioned on the show before, spun out of that Nightfall arc in Batgirl and came into this because she really fits here. I want to see her in the future in the new 52. I want to see all these characters. Oh, God, yeah. And she's she's one of those redemption-type characters because she was pretty much a full-on villain before, mm-hmm. and she's now the hero fighting. And it's what it is, It's she recognizes, okay, I was on the wrong team. I this is where I should be. This is and I like the fact that she's paying for, you know, just the, her past crimes and even that great issue where Batgirl was in and dealing with them was dealing with the movement and those two had issues, but even Batgirl's like, Okay, this is maybe something and she backed off of the movement and let them do their thing. I thought that was some those were some great moments and this is a character that you know, she could so work in so many different titles that she can make appearances. You know, someone like Mouse, he'd be interesting in another book, but I can't see him doing like a long term appearance not outside of this universe. He works great here, but I don't know if I could see him in like say the Justice League. Catharsis, I could see her fighting alongside them. You know, Virtue, I could definitely see her fighting alongside them. It's you know, there's a lot that they could do with these characters in other titles and other books. Teen so, Titans. Teen Titans, yeah. Any of them in Titans. Yeah. I really could see these characters. Not that I want them split. I don't mean it that way. It's just more of a... To me, when you introduce new character concepts, the series just doesn't sell the way you want it to, which is... That, to me, is... I hate to admit say it that way, because I love this book. You take a look at those characters and go, wow, a lot was really developed here. What can we do with these characters now? There's places you can use these characters. I would love to see any of these characters graduate to Teen Titans. Just so they're used still, because yes. it would be a shame to see them not used. And I, I, I we'll see what happens with them. Yeah, and I you know and seeing Mouse dealing you know, t- seeing seeing uh 
Tim deal with mouse would be actually be kind of funny. So I would adore I'm gonna throw it. Out the, my, throw away my line about keeping him in this universe. Seeing other characters deal with him and interact with him would be kind of interesting because he is so out there and he is so mouse that somebody who's not used to this guy, someone who's not regularly, you know, they could play a really great straight man to him. One of the girls could be on Birds of Prey. Oh, God, yeah. Again, uh, Catharsis. She could, or, you know, however it's pronounced. I've, I always called her Catharsis, so mm-hmm. if that's incorrect, um, I'm just going to keep calling her Catharsis because that's what I'm used to. But I could see her in Birds of Prey very easily. Not even just because of the wing theme, just because, again, the personality and her, you know, making uh, you know, reparations for what she did in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I, when something is developed with this kind of depth, and and they're this interesting. I would love to see some or all of these characters appear somewhere else. Now, now the, when the big swerve did happen with the you know the cop waiting and you know you know um, with the wit just waiting to take his you know to you know take his revenge, take out some people. You know, were you when you read it? Were you completely surprised, or did you go, "Oh, why did I see that before?" That's where I was. Yeah. Um, cause Canon, obviously Canon has been so well developed in this that it wasn't a big shock that he would be involved with him, you know, cause he, he was basically on the cell phone with Mr. Witt saying, you know, they're going to kill my son, take them out, Mr. Witt, which means all of that was prearranged. Yeah. Uh, well, in the issue, beginning of this, uh, issue in the cemetery scene, when he's talking to his assistants, did you talk to the, uh, the police? Yes. He's, you know, he's, he's on board with us. And I didn't. I just completely breezed through that. I didn't did even realize that until this moment. As soon as he said, "Wait," I'm like, "Of course, crooked cop." Oh, and now I went. Actually, went back and reread this issue. The the couple panels. I was like, "Oh, that's cool." Okay, I did. They they gave us the answer that it was going to happen, and I still didn't see it coming because I still had all these big visions in my head of what was going to happen with the uh, the movement and what's going to happen with him, et cetera. And I was like, "Oh, that's awesome." The whole. Um her and her dad and the robbing of the bank and the relationship with mirrors that was going on there. That was a story that I needed to see what their relationship was like. And I love how mirrors started putting two and two together and realizing who she actually was. His whole whole rationalization of she's like, so you're going to arrest me for what being shot at? (laughs) I think I might get some donuts and a milkshake kind of come with when your shift is done. And just kind of interesting to see how like these two, he's kind of like, you know what? Listen, I, I, We've kind of come full circle here. I don't know what our relationship's going to be. I don't know if we're going to actually be friends or something like that. I know, you don't, you know you've lost your father. Uh, we've kind of hit this point of honesty between us where there are things we probably will never be able to say to each other because of the nature of what I do and the nature of what you do. <laughs> but I would still like to look in and check and see that you're okay from time to time. I think her kind of realization of his acceptance and his understanding of... I may never fully be able to understand what you're all about. Because even he even gets it wrong about her wanting to be a part of the Justice League or whatever, all that stuff, you know. You're never going to change enough to fit in with them. She's like, that was never part of the plan. But sooner or later, Captain, they're going to have to change to fit in with us. There's something to that. Super teams, in order for them to... It's one of the funny things. People get upset sometimes that, oh, DC did the New 52 and they changed the Justice League. These teams have changed throughout their history to match the times. They do evolve. They are malleable. Uh, you know, you take a look at the original concept. It wasn't the Justice League. It was the Justice Society. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that evolved into the Silver Age Justice League, which I've read that material. It's super cool. But if you take a look at what the Silver Age team was like, the theme and the tone, how it changed even when you go to the Engelhart era with the satellite and how the team used to bicker with each other there. We went to the Detroit League. We went to the Bwahaha era. Uh, we went to Morrison taking over. You know, and on and on and on. You know, when uh, there's something to these teams evolving and adapting over time and these characters doing it. There's an interesting point in what she's saying. You know, we are, this book in many ways is representative of, you know, kind of reaching where the readers live. And that's something that the bigger teams, the bigger books need to be able to do from time to time. There's so much in here that's like, um, I'm connecting to as a fan, putting my own subtext in there. But I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's funny because this this is a teen book, even though they're older than teens. Yeah. You know, they're, you know, though, you know, it's, they're not, it's not a kid book, but you do see that, 
I don't want to say childlike innocence because it's not really. They've been through some horrific stuff in their life, but they have that mindset and that idea that you know, yes, these heroes are these great heroes sitting up on Mount Olympus, but they need to, you know, they need to change. They need to start looking at what they're doing and why they're doing it. And a lot of times in like the real world, when I'll get, you know, I'll talk to younger people and they'll have the man, this is wrong. We gotta do the mood change and this and it. and I just want to sit back and say, kid, you have no idea how the world works. You know, sit back, relax, and in a couple of years you'll figure it out. Well, when I listen to them talking about how they, it's about the ultimate good, I don't get that annoyance. I don't get that anger. I like that how they're com- they're, mess- they're spreading their message without being the annoy- annoying little kid who doesn't really know how the world works. They know how the world works, and they work within the world, but they want it to be something better. And I, that final line about, you know, they're going to have to change to fit in with us was a great just way to sum it up that, yeah, you know, there's this out there. But guess what? You can always look at, you know, this is the right thing. This is what you got to do. And I like I just like that feeling behind it. I related to this book a lot. The way that I related to like the Claremont run on the X-Men when it was the small I'm talking about before we got into having multiple books. When it was a small family-like core group of a team, I'm not knocking anything. You know, when it expanded, I don't mean it that way. I just meant that there was something intimate about the team that was there. It's it's what drew me in, made me a fan, ongoing. This has those qualities. It, you know, it, um, the Teen Titans era with Wolfman and Perez had that as well. You know, it was an intimate team. We got to see them in and out of the costume. Which, a lot of times, team books, if you've got characters that have solo titles, you don't have the ability always to show them out of the costume with the kind of depth you can explore it when they don't. In both of those books that I'm talking about, you know, the Teen Titans back then and the X-Men back then, they didn't have solo books for those characters. So their stories were contained within the team book title. You could explore the family relationship, the interpersonal relationships with the characters, the way that you could in the movement. That was something I really found myself greatly drawn to about this. And I'm putting it that way. Just If you're somebody listening to this and you never picked up this book, it's only 12 issues, and I highly recommend it for that intimacy that you get with these characters. Uh, their relationships to each other, to me, are just as integral as their relationships with the police, their relationships with the villains. Uh, it's really an important part of the book. I would actually say it's its even more important than those other relationships, with the exception of mirrors. Yeah. And I love that. I, it's something that's really, really important to me. Amen. Our next book is going to be The Batgirl Annual Number 2, When Pamela Gets Blue. Written by Gail Simone, art by Robert Gill and Javier Garon. Colors by Romulo Ferrado. It's F F A J A R D O Jr. Letters by Rob Lay. Cover by Clay Mann and Paul Mounts. Editor Katie Kubert. Group editor Mark Doyle. Batman created by Bob Kane. Hey, you know, I'm going to ask a question about that. Why, when it's Batgirl, is it Batman created by Bob Kane? Like, I mean, because- I would love to see who Bat. You know, the Batgirl story there. If that makes sense. Yeah, who actually created Batgirl? And yeah. was it Bob Kane or what happened with that? And I think part of the reason is Bob Kane's attorneys did a really good job with protecting yeah. uh, Bob Kane and his and uh, his creation. That's that's why we get all of this. Okay, I would put a little addendum underneath there and put down Batgirl created by. Right. Amen to your answer. If that makes sense. That's probably what it was. But I would love to see that only because you know that, that she's such an important iconic character. Kind of like to see that acknowledgement there as well. I really enjoyed this. I, I didn't, when I saw the cover of it being Poison Ivy and Batgirl, I didn't realize this was going to be an opportunity for Gail Simone to write the new 52 Birds of Prey. Yeah. And I, oh, I got to be honest with you, as a geeky fan who's adored her work on Birds of Prey in the previous universe, I was insanely curious to see how she would handle this group. Can we put her on that book? Can we, and this is no knock to anybody on the book. Now I don't like, can we do birds of prey two and like have both running? Cause I'm liking the current book a great deal. So I'm not knocking it, but oh my gosh, when I read this, I would love to see her on these characters in the new 52. Uh, she just so gets the relationships. 
you know, the right away starting out, when you turn the page and you start off with them sitting on a ledge, having, uh, I don't get it, background, no criminal records? Right, one of them, I mean, just this conversation with the two of them, but to me, it's the internal dialogue. In this community, this Cape thing, I have a lot of people I respect. A smaller handful I trust, and a couple I flat out adore. Black Canary is in the center of all of those groups. I haven't been back in the call very long, but Dinah's faith in me never wavered. And you know where that's critical to me? One thing we've seen in Gail Simone's run with Batgirl is the fact that Barbara's needed those people who have relied on her and trusted in her to step back into the cape and cowl and believe that she is a major player when she didn't believe it herself. Dinah was one of those people. This is another example of, let's go back to, at the core, what is their relationship like? What has it been like in the New 52? What makes people like these two together in the previous universe, the current universe? It's moments like this. That page, I read a couple times over before moving on, just because I loved every bit of those moments. It's a geeky fan moment for me because I love the relationship between these two characters. It wasn't about fisticuffs and, you know, beating people up. It was about these two being friends. There are certain friendships in the DC universe that are really important. I used to be a big fan of the Batgirl Supergirl friendship way back when. When Birds of Prey kicked off, it started off this new relationship between Oracle and Dinah. And there's something about that that they became buddy cops. It's like what we liked with uh, Catman and Deadshot. There's certain characters that when you put them together, they start becoming identifiable together. By the way, hint, hint, they need... They, can we get Catman and Deadshot back together again oh in the God, New 52? Please. please? <laughs> Do we not understand that this works? <laughs> you know, at some point. But I just loved smashing through the window. They're going into this combat sequence. Barbara's got this big smile on her face. I loved that. There's something about when you're doing this with your friends, you get charged, there's an energy. That's what it's all about, and we connect with that because it reminds us of our best friendships. You know, the fact that you're doing this together, whatever this thing is, and that there's a trust and there's a comfort, and you're not hiding from yourself, you're completely being you in that moment. That's what their relationship is. That's when we get into the action, it means more. Yeah, I, one of the things that I absolutely love about... Uh her writing is we get these wonderful inner dialogues and it's something that, you know, throughout every, you know, throughout the Batgirl 31, throughout this, throughout all the Batgirl, we get these great, you know, dialogue that we know exactly where she's going Mm -hmm. and we know where she is along the route and it's nothing, it's, it helps, you know, get that connection again to Barbara as opposed to with Batgirl. You know, and those are the stuff that I think that makes me really say how much I love this character and how much I love this book is because I already have this great connection. So when you talk about just everything you were saying, I'm sitting there just nodding my head saying, yes, 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 more of that, please. It's, again, this team dynamic. You're jumping right into this team. We know exactly who they are. If this was the first time reading of this, you know, if I wasn't reading Birds of Prey before, I would have this immediate connection. I would have this understanding of who these people are just because he, you know, she's played out this great line of who everybody is. Like, yeah, I know, I trust, you know, I, you know, everything, you know, that Dinah is, this is the person, the people that I want to be around. She trusts these people. I'm good with them. We're going to work together. We're going to do this. Oh, yeah. And then we've got the last one that we, none of us trust. You know? At the core of that team is that relationship between Barbara and Dinah. It led to, in the previous run, an extension to Helena, who then became a core member of that group. But seeing those two together, and you see it in the hierarchy when you come through and you see that the two members are sneaking in, and they're, they're, they're not quite in the same place as this relationship. Barbara's a little standoffish with them, which was what you're alluding to, and I love that. The bittersweet one, and I really loved how this annual explored this, is Poison Ivy. She was there. She was the square peg in the round hole. But yet there's that part of her that sees what they've got as a team, and probably the best and the best of the members, and sees people that she admires that she wishes she could become friends with. But there's that broken part of her that won't allow that. It's 
it adds a tragedy to the character that I think, to me, the best Poison Ivy stories, you see this with her relationship with Bruce a lot in the best Poison Ivy stories, where you kind of get that, like, okay, she goes about things horribly wrong, and there's things that she does that are horrid to people in the name of, you know, being this kind of ecological terrorist that she is. But deep down in there, there is a glimmer of a good person. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. That's, that's not, I'm not saying that's excusing. She's a villain. She's a criminal. Got it. But that's for some people, they're just inherently completely 100% broken. I like Poison Ivy because she's complex. Yeah. There are times where, like, you can see her in certain stories and just kind of go, you know, she's not all bad. Um, and that doesn't excuse anything, but that's not the whole story. It, with a lot of the with a lot of the Batman villains, you know, I I understand why you know the Bat doesn't kill, and I love that about the character. But mm-hmm. I always, when I read the books, I always think, okay, if I was Batman, what would I do? And with a lot of them, I would have killed them. You know, Joker flat out. You know, there's no redeeming, no saving Joker. You know, but I, you know, Poison Ivy's always the one mm-hmm. that I'm like, you know what? She actually is mentally unbalanced. There is that mm-hmm. mental thing okay. to her that, you know, it's, I don't want to justify what she did, but maybe with proper help, she could actually be a productive member of society. She could be the female Swamp Thing, you know, very easily. You look at just how Swamp Thing has this connection with the green and the planets, but he does fight for, you know, for, for what's right. Pamela has that same connection, but along the way, she got a little bit, you know, broken, a little bit twisted inside the head. And I always think that if the, with the right, you know, care, with the right physicians, with the right people, you know, with her hanging out with the right people, you could actually see her becoming a hero, becoming instead of Poison Ivy being, I don't know, whatever, you know, good name, you know, associated with plants, you know, she would be, but you could see her becoming a hero and protecting society while still protecting nature, while still stopping these people who are destroying and corrupting, you know, the, the killing the planet, you know, she could, you know, learn along the ways, the compassion and the mercy. How much of that is chemical? You know, I mean, there's obviously a mental part that you're talking about and I agree with, this issue, one of the things I love about it is it alludes to the chemical portions of it as well. I don't think it's with her. It's, it's all of one thing. I think there's a, that's where she is complex. There's a lot going on here. It's why we see her to go to varying... And I think one of the great things that Gail Simone has done here is explained why there's so many extremes with Poison Ivy. Yes. Why she can wind up being almost heroic in one book and then you know later on can be completely twisted in another. It's because of the influence of all of these things she connects with in our world and not all of them uh, i mean some of them have toxins and poisons yeah. and things like that that she absorbs makes a part of her they twist and turn her as well it's one of the reasons why i i agree with you on the only way to rehabilitate her would be to disconnect her from all that and i don't know that she ever could yeah cuz you're right I, she could be but you would really have to she would be like an addict that you would have to keep away from like any form of plant life. <laughs> but then again, to do that would kill her. Right. You know, just, it's such a part of her life that it's, you know, and, and I like the references they did with uh, seasonal stuff where in the different seasons, she's going to have different views and different, you know, things, just like with the plant world. Yeah, the seasonal where, affective disorder. Yeah. I love that. That was mm-hmm. awesome. And again, it's, you know, um, you know, you look at just these opening sequences when they're fighting and this really cool team dynamics and she's in there just really throwing people around. She had that moment where she had a hard time distinguishing between hostage and bad guy. And she's <laughs> getting ready to crush a hostage and mm-hmm. Batgirl's got to stop her. Hey, that's a hostage. You know, let her go. <laughs> and I like seeing this, the fact that she's like, hello, neat. Hello, little mammal. <laughs> you know, it's not a difference of person. It's, you know, you're not a plant. You're dead. <laughs> I really love the use of Barbara's roommate in this with yeah. the whole, you know, they built a garden up there and, and Barbara thinking of the, and, and you know what? I don't know that I wouldn't think the same way Barbara was there. Uh, I love the idea that her roommate was like, you know, Hey, we want to share this with everybody who's hungry. And I get that. I think that's really, really cool. But Barbara coming from the standpoint of, 
you know, hey, look, there are people who are going to come in and they're going to take. It's interesting how the two of them had to, you know, Barbara had to learn more about her. Unfortunately, her roommate had to learn about Barbara's side of it the hard way. Um, in the end, I liked that Barbara sided with her roommate because I think the the idea that we should keep trying to do good things, even when somebody spits in the face of it, there's a point to that. You know, it's, it's the only way to send the message that you keep persevering. And I think that was really well handled here. You know, that Barbara learned something with how this roller coaster ride went. The roommate sort of did, but Barbara wanted to restore that hope because Barbara's like, nah, you know what? You're right. And we need more people like you that are willing to fly in the face of the, the snarkiness, the, the sense of hopelessness, the sense of just looking out for me. We need more people that are willing to look out for others and just kind of accept that that's okay to share and to care and, and you know, try to feed as many people as we can and do nice things for others. I just thought that was a neat little story in light of everything that's going on in this story with Poison Ivy. It was neat how that relationship oh, yeah, yeah. related back. It was, I think that's one of the neat things about an annual is sometimes you get to tell a longer form story that really develops a lot of characters and relationships this really did a nice job of that. I like annuals when they're taken advantage of like this. This took advantage of the annual format. It wouldn't have worked as well being broken up. Yeah, and I, I so completely was seeing life the way Barbara was seeing it. Mm -hmm. you know, again, I, I volunteer. I help out when I can. But in the end, I do look at risk assessment. It's, it's, you know, a, it's an occupational hazard. I look at, you know, what is going to be, what could go wrong? Where do we need to, you know, security looking at the talk about the cameras, everything. I was like, yeah, he, you need to have that up there just in case, you know, but again, as her roommates going on, I'm like, yeah, she's right. You know, we, this is a neighborhood, you know, this is a neighborhood uh, garden and the neighborhood should be allowed to, Hey, you need the food, come and take it. But, there is that dark side. And as she's going through this whole thing, I am thinking completely with what we saw happen where, you know, people came in and trashed it just to trash it, you know, just to be, you know, obnoxious, just to be just because they're, you know, a little twisted in the head or maybe, you know, mommy and daddy didn't show enough attention as a child. I don't know why people do hurtful things just to be hurtful, but you got to see this and it happened here. And it was something that, as this whole speech is going on, I'm hoorahing for the hoorahing for the you know, for you know the roommate. But the whole time I'm thinking, man, something bad's going to happen here. And you know, it's yeah, it happens. And that's unfortunately it's a thing of Gotham, but it's also an unfortunate thing in society where you have these noble intentions, and sometimes you know people take that take advantage of those no you know of you know people trying to help. They take advantage of it or. They just smash it for the fun of it because, you know, they're not good people. It's I love seeing, again, outside of costume moments of this character, of her family, of her extended family, of her roommate, of just general society. You know, we get to see these moments, and that's what brings me in and connects me to the character. Seeing Ivy connect with humanity with the organ farm story and what was going on with Tucker and the dog. Yeah. And coming back on her own and having that moment where she's like, I'm going to do something that Batgirl couldn't because it's merciful. And that need to show mercy and her learning, in many ways she's learning from Batgirl because of that. Or, or maybe connecting with a very, very deep part of herself because of that relationship with Batgirl. That moment where she turns and even says, I'm sure your daughter loves you. You know, just We're kind of seeing an acknowledgement there that there's that little girl still in there with her. And I just, I loved the visual. I loved the build to that. I loved the attention that it paid to the history we've seen of Poison Ivy in the New 52. It just, it really all worked there. It was it was one of those moments that just shows again, boy, when, you know, Gail writes a story, you know, she gets to the core of who these characters are. And I love, that was a very, very emotional moment. It was cool. Oh, God, yeah. And I love the moments where, where Batgirl is just really giving it to her about not mm -hmm. having emotion, not having friends or family. And Ivy's like, I do have a friend, my Harley. And I thought that was a really cool, again, moment of 
there is something more between Ivy and Harley Quinn. They are friends. And this is, it's, you look at the weird relationship between the two of them. You look at their friendship in, you know, Harley's book as well. You see there is that friendship. There is that connection. And I, I kind of like the fact that she was, you know, fighting back to, you know, fighting back to Barbara saying, no, I do have friends. I'm not, you know, this oh, wait, complete you're monster. You're skipping over the other part though, too. I thought maybe I might have more than one someday. Yeah. And she's alluding to her own feelings about Barbara. Yeah. That in spite of everything, that she had a hope for that. And I, Barbara's right. I mean, you know, when she, when she start doing that, I tried to kill you kind of thing, that kind of ruins that. Um, so Barbara's point's well met. But there is, it shows that in spite of, the, in that twisted nature that is Ivy, that she did make a connection with this group and Barbara. And I'm sure she probably feels similarly about Dinah. You know, there is kind of that alluding to thing there. And it's, it's almost tragic that it, the way that it played. I, l- I like tragic stories like that in comics because they don't, friendships and things don't always work out the way you want them to. Um, and there's something you can connect with in, in how this played out. Very, very well done. Yeah, but they also, and it was neat by the end, though, you do see that there is a, still a chance of a friendship between her and uh, Batgirl. Because Batgirl does have mercy and does have compassion and does have those higher qualities, and you kind of see her, you know, working with, you know, working with Ivy, saying, "Pamela, you know, don't kill him. I know he probably deserves it, but I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about your soul." I love those moments where, we, again, we see Batgirl fighting to, you know, save a person who. For all practical purposes, she really shouldn't. This is just, you know, she could very easily look at her as just another villain, just another rogue, just another, you know, thug that I'm going to take down. But there is still, Barbara is still that compassionate person. She is still that, you know, there's still a glimmer of hope. Maybe I can reach that person. Maybe I can save her. And I loved seeing those moments. And I agree with you in the sense of everything that you're saying there, except for the part where they could be friends. Here's where they're ultimately doomed to have a tragedy with that. If the two of them never went down the paths that they did and they met each other, they probably would have been very close friends, dear friends. The fact that both of them wound up on very different sides of the track... Anytime they tried to fully cross that track, one of them's getting hit by the train. <laughs> it's just it's just a reality. Good analogy. <laughs> I mean, it's it's really kind of the way that it is. It, it everything that you're talking about is there. You're right, but I don't think because so much has happened, uh, more cars were headed out of the train, so to speak, <laughs> that there's no way to cross those tracks safely anymore. You know, fully. You know, you yeah. can maybe visit the other side. But ultimately, all your stuff is still going to be on the other side of the tracks, and you're going to have to go back to it at some point. That's what they're trapped with. And it's funny because I still hope. I still have hope. You have to. I still hope for Ivy that she can cross the tracks. Mm -hmm. And she'll figure out. She'll find the bridge. She'll find, you know whatever way it takes she'll do it and i'm like yeah and i'd like to see you know barbara swing in and help her come over and help her cross over to the light and you know because ivy would make a one heck of a hero and sure. make a great you know champion of the planet you know she just she just got to learn a little you know she's just got to learn a little mercy and some more compassion and just you know that that person i, I don't want to say humanity because to be honest she doesn't need to be more human but she does need to have just that little spark, that little thing that makes the difference between a hero and a regular person. That little spark that means the difference between doing what's right and doing what's easy or doing what's wrong. And it's she has glimmers that she could maybe have that spark, but she doesn't completely cross over because – you know, the hero lifestyle is a very difficult one on people, and it's very hard to stay honest and stay true down the path. And, you know, that's why some of these long-term characters, these heroes that have been around, and these, these you know, young people who are taking, could have very easily go the easy route, but no, they're going to take the hard route. That's what truly makes them the heroes. And it's, you know, she's one that she could pull it off, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah for short periods of time. Uh, I think it's going to be, you know, you would see her more do that in like a team book like Birds, like what we saw. Right. Or Suicide Squad. But she's ultimately the one that's going to turn on them because of the volatile nature of what she of what she is. Not who she is, what she is. I think that's the problem. The only way to really redeem her would be for her to no longer be Poison Ivy. 
if she ever did get the cure, if she ever did go full on human and yeah, want the that, and want and accept the cure, right? Otherwise, she's going to put herself back in that place. Yeah, I did chuckle by the way at that scene where he's promising her the cure. Mm-hmm. The, I was just laughing, going, "You really think she wants that?" She, she doesn't want that, dude. And, I, and sure enough, she lashes out and she's wrapped the icicle, the ice tentacle around his neck and going, I'm going to kill you now, meat. Goodbye. I'm like, dude, you gotta, if you're going to be in a negotiation, you have to have something that the other party wants. You know, telling her, hey, I can make you human. She doesn't want to be human. And I, I love just that fact that, you know, this whole time I'm sitting there thinking, this ain't going to work. And it doesn't work. I'm like, yes, I'm right. <laughs> you know, it was that. You know, the characters, again, you know, it's tragic, wonderful humor mixed all blend in with some cool action, some great just the, these great humanistic moments coming from a person who's not really a human. But, you know, she wants yeah, I don't want to say she doesn't want to be, but somewhere inside her, there is that spark. And I'm like, ah, man, I want to see that. I do, too. I, it's it's you know you that to me is one's a story of tragedy when you want to see the other outcome yeah and that's where it's cool you want to talk about issue number thirty one oh god yeah our next book will be Batgirl number thirty one the writer is Gail Simone with penciler Fernando P A S A R I N with uh, Jonathan Galapian as inker colorist is blonde letterer D Z C N T Cover artist Alex Gardner with a variant cover, the Batman theme 66 by Mike and Laura, Laura Allred. The assistant editor is Matt Humphreys. The editor is Katie Kubert with uh, Mark Doyle as group editor. And, of course, Batman created by Bob Kane. Yeah, I, oof. I talked to you this morning and I said, we need to talk about this. Oh, and my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, after I read, because I read the, you hadn't read the issue as of this morning. And because that was my first thing. I'm like, did you read Bad Girl 31? And he said, no, I didn't know it came out this week yet. And I'm like, you're going to thank me. <laughs> you need to read this. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Oh my God, this was outstanding, wonderful stuff. And again, this was, you know, with Ragdoll, one, Ragdoll coming back, that we both love the character. But two, again, the stuff we just talked about in the Batgirl annual, about the inner dialogue, about the characterization, about this personal connection to who these these characters are in and out of the costume, 100% escalated and one once again very just said this is why we love this book this is why we love this creative team this right here you're seeing it because we've got great inner costume out of costume the supporting cast everything that's happened within just one it comic issue is like oh my god this is awesome i love monkeys <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh was this great you know what i loved about it it read very horror movie when it yes. came to him. He's a creepy dude, and he should read like this. Because, you know, we're used to reading him from Secret Six most recently. And you see him with other villains where he's a part of the team. And, and he had an incredible creep factor there. But because you're on, it's kind of our analogy earlier about the train, you're on the other side of the tracks running with the villains, you're going to view him differently than when you're on the opposite side now Riding along with the hero and or and the hero's friends and roommates and supporting cast. And you put him in that light, and this is really how you can take the same character concept at its core, but show us it from a different lens, at a different angle, and add such a unique creep factor, yet this is so totally ragdoll. I ooh, I I got wound up at the end of this saying to myself, Can we get a series with this guy immediately? And and like because I want to read more. I immediately wanted to read more Ragdoll at the end of this one. Woo! Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was so good <laughs> right from his first appearance. Because oh my gosh, was they were like because I frankly don't see how. Hello, hello. Yeah. You got him in that twisted, contorted. His head's backwards. I mean, oh my gosh, what's going on there? It was great. 
Well, again, you talk about just that horror theme to it because they're like, he swooped in and took out Terry. You know, we got to see how they're like, yeah, we got to go. We got to run. Stay together. No, we should split up. He's like, no, stay together. It's so much more fun. I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> I like it when all the bits, piece, the bits and pieces fall off. I'm like, oh, my God. This is, you know, and again, that beautiful tormenting and taunting them from the shadows. And we get that final sequence where he's that initial opening where he's just all bent and twisted and distorted. And you see the terror in both their faces going, ah, as they're screaming. I was like, oh, this is so cool. I love that when his mask comes off, he's even creepier. Yes. You know, like his mask is kicked off. And normally that like is um, a weakness. You know what I mean? Like if, if you take a mask off a villain, sometimes that gives them their identity. And when you take that off, they all of a sudden become diminished. Because, like, you've revealed their vulnerability or something. With this guy, it's just the opposite. Like, please put that back on. Because <laughs> the mask is creepy in and of itself. Because masks yeah. like that just give me a creep factor. But when that's kicked off and you see him in the shadows with, you know, the, you know, barely any hair and, and just that just kind of squirrely, creepy look about him. The art team really did a nice job on this one. It really is. Woo. You know, painting a a villain. Um, this one needed to be nailed right. Yeah. And when, and I say that from the standpoint of this is again a love letter to the fans. It was a every bit of a home run. It's amazing how you can take a character that we know and love, like Secret Six shortlist. It's one of my favorite. It's easily in my top five of all time. And if I really thought it through and started like. Weighing things out, it's probably in the top two, you know, because it's just it's that important to me as a series. Oof! Yeah. When you get these moments with Ragdoll here, and you make me feel like he's been taken to the next level, this took him to the next level. Yes. Uh, wow. You know what? I just gotta again, because you said it, but I gotta just reiterate just the compliments to the full creative team on this. Uh-huh. This is a beautifully written story, but also this art team. You know, you got some great pencil work, but then you get these the inking and the colorist. Both really when you're doing these heavy shadowy sequences, you could lose details. You could lose yourself in the darkness. Well, here we've got some great work and great usage of the different color spectrums, but it's still shadowy, dark and creepy and just absolutely wonderful. And I love the fact that we don't lose and it's it doesn't become so heavy shadowy focus that we lose the aspects of the buildings of the you know the fact that you know you know where they are who they are what they're dealing with you know I love just seeing this and just again that opening pose of him after they knock off his mask and he's just sitting there kind of in that you know the the, the I want to say it's kind of like a Spider Man like pose where he's you know wapa spread out but it's not so friendly and pleasant like you would think from uh, Spidey but it's still that same kind of that moment he's ready to strike this is a danger this is something that's going to hurt you extremely and I love just how that that came across Ricky and Barbara I don't want to shortchange that because there's something important there that's going on. You know, she's walking in and saying, geez, after everything, you know, I couldn't go into the hospital. And I love that there is an issue with that with her. You know, that she has multiple times referenced uh, how she believes in the hospital system because of how much it did for her. But she can't. There's like a phobia there. And that would be a traumatic place for her just because of so much associated with it. it to the point where you hear about people doing that with funerals. You know, and, and certain th- and I, there's probably other areas, too, that I'm just not thinking of at the moment. Uh, probably people have difficulty walking into police stations, fire departments, and things like that, depending on what their life experience has been. So you see her just not being able to go in. She finally goes to visit him and thinks, like, okay, I haven't been a good girlfriend. He's going to dump me. You know, we're, we were just getting started. So they don't have this, like, years and years relationship. This was something that was just in its preliminary phases. My dad shot him. (laughs) That's a tough one. That's a tough one to work through. (laughs) So not realizing that the actual thing that he wanted to talk to her about is, I'm suing your father. But there's also, apparently, from when she's leaving, more to the story. He's like, let me explain. I want want to know his side of it. And I love that we were left in a place where... We're riding along with Barbara. He, she doesn't know everything. We know there's something else there. She might go over that in her head, maybe. Um, but 
what a difficult thing. And what do you do in that situation? I, I, I don't know. I, I see his side of it. I also see hers. Yeah, and it's it's a tough call to make. And it's, you know, there's going to be part two of this conversation. Mm-hmm. You know it's going to happen just because, you know, one, you know, you can't end the story with that. So there's going to be more. There's going to go through the trial and or hearings or maybe there'll be settlement. Who knows what actually is going to play out. So there's more coming down the line on this. And my guess is because he's talking about a lawyer, high price. I'm thinking it's, you know, one of her villains. Yeah. You know, one of her, you know, you know, specifically, you know, the, um, oh God, what's her name? I just drew a blank. Oh, Nightfall? Thank you. I'm like, I just drew a blank because she's got the money, she's got the power, and she's got what it takes to, and so I'm thinking she's behind the lawsuit. She's behind everything. Does it have to be a villain? I don't, it doesn't have to be because this could very easily be, you know, um, just a lawyer coming to visit because you know, to be honest, you think about the story, what happened, wrongful, you know, shooting, or was it a wrongful shooting? A lot of questions will be raised. There's a lot of areas. And I could see a lawyer going up to him saying, hey, dude, you know, you got a golden opportunity here. This is what you can go with. I, my, it, my dad was working on a job as an electrician, and the ladder he was on collapsed, and he fell, and he broke multiple bones. And there was constant attorneys calling the house saying, Hey, you know, you got a great lawsuit here. And to up to the point where on the, like the last couple days of when he still had, you know, the, um, the jurisdiction to actually, you know, the, to, to file, they kept calling him and saying, Hey, you know, we can still do this. We can still file right now. It's not too late. You know, statute of limitations is not up. And they kept trying to get dad to sue this company. And dad's like, no, that's, that's not how we roll. That's, that's not our way our, we are. But I can very easily see a legitimate lawyer just saying, this is a good thing, you know, talk to him and seeing where it goes. But in the back of my head, especially because there was the people observing, you know, everybody who came into the hospital was taking pictures of Barbara. And I'm thinking, OK, OK, that's the bad guy keeping a tab on him, keeping a tab on her. But the funny thing is, when this was all playing out, it, this is something that came back to me after reading through the first time, after seeing the suit, after seeing all that stuff. And you go back through and read through a second time. So, again, really cool crafted story that we have this person out there. And Barbara's saying, hey, funny feeling. Maybe this is the hospital. And we see this person. So I'm thinking, okay, distant story, maybe down the line. Now the lawsuit kicks in. So, again, it could be the bad guys doing the lawyer or it could be a legitimate lawyer. It could be option C that I haven't even thought of yet. Now, the interesting part is with Ragdoll, it's this weird code that he's got about, you know, purchase services, so to speak, (laughs) you know, and the fact that, okay, there's no witnesses and and he's taking certain people out. Um, I love the intensity of seeing him kind of choking out the witnesses before. Yeah. And going after the two girls saying, okay, I need to take them out because they could see. I like that the girls were duped or at least the roommate definitely was, yeah. into thinking that she was just unleashing a stink bomb, when in reality she was unleashing something that would have killed them both, and their whole crew, yeah. as well as anyone in the building. So they thought they were just doing something to send a terrorist message that would be harmless to a certain extent. I mean, it would make the it would render the building unlivable for a certain amount of time because of the stench. But they weren't doing anything that would really physically harm anybody. Not that it's any le- you know, any more legal what they were doing, but at least in their mind, they weren't harming somebody. The, the twist of just being knowing that they were being duped all along, you know, the, coming off of the whole attractiveness, how dedicated are you to the cause? You know, are you, there's this need when you get involved with something a lot of times to be more involved than somebody else to do more than somebody else, to be a little bit more relevant to the cause than somebody else. If you're doing it for the right reasons and you have all of the correct information, that can be a very, very good thing. On the other hand, you can be manipulated by that into doing things that really take you far away from the original path that you went on. I love that exploration in this, how easy it is to manipulate somebody. And I mean, I'm all for people getting involved with causes and and for them pushing themselves to take the next step with it. But in this case, she wasn't asking the right questions. She was being pulled in by the, the attractiveness to be just a little bit more important to what they were doing. And and the compliments. 
You know, which oh, we all fall. I we all fall prey, prey to that, and th- there's a reality to that and a realism that I loved. And I tell you, I it was um, this sequence was something that after we learned later on what had happened and that it was actual, you know, it was it was going to be the toxic. You go back through and you reread that page a second time, and you really see the fact that he goaded her in, and she jumped. At, what do you mean we can do that? But also, I love the sequence where she's looking at the device and he goes, "Careful, you don't want to open that here." You know, and you can kind of see the whoa look on his eyes. He's he went from being this very calm, you know, you know, martini sipping guy to being, "Hey, hey, hold on, right there, don't open it up here." You know. And and I love the fact that that was some great art details, especially around the eyes. You can really see there's something more to this. And again, something completely didn't notice or even think of until later on. And I thought that was, again, this book had some really awesome swerves in it. And, you know, I loved how it played and, you know, had me drawn in right along with them. I love that she doesn't abandon her friend, even though she's done something severely boneheaded. Yes. <laughs> you know, she's she's like even says that I you know I've got to compartmentalize, you know, and not in those words, but you know, it's the process of compartmentalize these emotions because right now I'm more worried about her safety, her life. You know, we could deal with that later. I I like that her first advice was call the police. It's better to be arrested by them than to wind up dead. You know, it's <laughs> you know, take take your punishment and then, you know, at least you'll still be with us and you have a chance to move forward. Uh, great advice that she gave her. But in the end, that's not going to be what's going to happen, and she has to go in and get involved herself as Batgirl to do something. I loved that part that it wasn't a he- there was no hesitation to go and rescue her. Coming from it's still coming from the place of she is my friend. Yeah, I loved that. Oh God, yeah, and I like the fact that when she said, "Yeah, we tried calling it and they don't believe us," and then later in the issue, at the end of the issue, we see, okay, really, it, it's all about the the power and the money and the connection of, you know, don't worry, we took care of the cops; they're not going to be around. So you know that when their initial call came in, it was really the big money affle- affecting stuff in Gotham. There still is corruption in Gotham PD. There still is corruption that's going on. So it wasn't just the fact that the cops like, ah, we're not going out there. There was more to the story. There was the big money influences preventing the police from showing up to make sure that their meta assassin would do their thing. Make sure that the the company stays off of the news radar and no one knows what actually happened in that building. I thought that was a great little nice side you know, piece to put right at the end of the the issue, just to let us know ra- again, wrapping all these pieces up. That was a really cool thing. I was like, "Dang, that's neat." I like. She asked the million dollar question: "Who are we doing this for?" Anytime people can't tell you that and you don't know who you're really working for, you got to say no. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to. Yeah. Uh, there co- there comes a point where uh, you know it's sorry. You know, I understand that you've got to keep confidence or whatever, but I'm not breaking into some place when I don't know who I'm doing it for. <laughs> Uh, that live and learn experience there. I loved. You're right that that reads differently the second time around. Yes, it and that to me is a sign of a great book. Um, honestly, I would say that that fits all three of the books we just talked about. The movement issue number twelve reads very different. The Batgirl annual read very different the second time through, and so did this. And <laughs> and all of them rich, reading them through the second time around. The the one thing I gotta say. Aw, so adorbs. You should totally date her. She seems nice, don't you think? You said you were going to kill me. Oh, right. Well, there is that. <laughs> Ragdoll. <laughs> He's just... But even, I love that. Even the pit, you know, you know who you're working for, right? Yeah. These people buy the water rights in poor countries, turning the indigenous people into slaves just to have access. They covered up a toxic waste spill that caused hundreds of deaths. They do obscene testing on live monkeys. Wait, what was that about monkeys? <laughs> All of that list that she read off, you know, never mind. A job is a job, I usually say. It's the erratic nature of Ragdoll. It didn't take anything away from the horror, yet for me, I'm like, this is this is the guy I loved in Secret Six. Yeah. But we're seeing him from that different lens. And that's the magic of this. When you understand a character like Gail Simone does, like Ragdoll, and you say, wait a minute, we're showing him now from the other side. We're really going to show people why you should be creeped out by this guy. Yet, there's something familiar there for the longtime yes. fans. Uh, that, woof, that really worked. Because, oh, this was super creepy. Oh, God. And you know what? That whole sequence right there 
once again, another one that second time read through when I stop and thought about it, because the first time I'm reading, I'm laughing because of the monkeys. I'm like, yeah. And then I went back and I started, when I was reading through it a second time, I was thinking, you know what? What she was doing that whole time was just stalling. She, in her mind, wasn't thinking, I'm going to convince this guy not to kill me. Only thing she's thinking is, I'm going to slow him down. I'm going to get my friend time to maybe get away. And as soon as that clicked in, I was like, oh, dang. And that so fits her. That fits through the character. That fits who she is and what she's about. And I loved, again, I was like, dang, that is cool. One thing I really enjoy about Batgirl is the endings aren't always a victory. They're survival at times. This was survival. She survived Ragdoll. She didn't, she reached a point where there was an impasse. Where he basically says, we can continue this, or you can take your friends and go right now. I don't know that she staying there would have been a good idea. Uh, it's it's a battle. Do you think she would have won? Well, that see, that was a beauty of the inner dialogue. Where all of her main, her normal arsenal stuff wasn't going to work. Mm-hmm. And she's like, can't go with holds, can't go with flipping, can't go with it. And she's breaking down the list of what she can do and what she can't. And she's like, she's just got to go pure on brute force and just start pummeling him. Right. And, you know, basically, you know, she was at a point where she's like, I, you know, it would have been a tough point for her. Now, I always put my money on the hero, especially too. always put my money on Barbara because, again, improvise, adapt, overcome is just part of who she is and part of the greatness of the character but you listen to the dialogue you listen to what was going on in her head she was up against something that was going to be really tough on her and very difficult you know for her to take out and i love just that moments again two characters recognizing okay this is where we're at right now i thought that was kind of neat the roommate being there i think would have ultimately in the end put her in a rough place because i think barbara one-on-one without that could have beat him, but he could have used that against her. Yeah. And I think that ultimately would have been the leverage edge that he needed in order to win the battle. I don't know. It would have been interesting to see. I love when there's battles like that, because this leaves room for round two with them that I so want to see. And that's really important when you build a villain. Like, you could you could end this in this issue and have her just cleanly beat him and put him into prison all that kind of stuff. Okay, Far more interesting when it ends like this and you're kind of like questioning, woof, what would have happened? And I'm with you. I side with the hero too. But I like when there's villains and battles that make me question because there's a reality to that. And I like that about Batgirl. I like that about her book that it's not always about, you know, when you're trying to do good, is it about your win-loss record against villains or is it about your win-loss record on ultimately saving and helping others? In this case, she erred on the side of saving and helping others to beating the bad guy. And I think that's more heroic. Because you let your ego drive you, you keep going after the villain. You are truly intrinsically driven by doing the right thing. You take care of the fallen. And I agree with her choice on this one. It's the harder choice, though, I think. Because you got to give up a piece of your ego to do what she did. Yeah. Well, the mission wasn't taking down Ragdoll. The mission was saving her friend. Yeah. And I think that is, again, that's Barbara. That is who she is. She wasn't going there to stop a robbery. She wasn't going there to stop, um, you know, these eco-terrorists or whatever you want to consider her and her roommates. She was going there to save their innocent lives. And she accomplished the mission. So, you know, yes, she gets a victory. No, she gets not because, you know, there is this bad guy that's ultimately out there. But you know what? That wasn't the important fight. That wasn't what this was about. And I, again, it's part of what makes her such a cool character is she has these distinction distinctions in herself. The interesting part with uh, what happened when we found out that Nightfall was really involved in this one, it goes back to we've seen Nightfall be sort of benevolent lately, you know, in the sense helping Barbara. We've been waiting for this other shoe to drop. Now it did. (laughs) And that to me is far more interesting than anything else when you kind of see behind the scenes, oh, okay, Um, there's some stuff going on here and she's flying right under the radar at the moment because I don't think Barbara's looking at her right now. Oh, no. And again, that's why part of me is thinking with... (laughs) You know, her being behind the lawyers, you think about it, she tried to get Barbara's roommate to go in there and, 
you know, drop the uh, toxins. And just part of it was against Mr. Rain. Part of it may have been a Batgirl thing. Part of it may have been a Barbara Gordon thing. If she, you know, knows the secret, maybe we're going to get some big reveals in that way. There's so much more in my head where I'm thinking this story could go just because she's been there and she had the roommate involved. And she, you know, maybe she's getting the uh, boyfriend, uh, Barbara Gordon's boyfriend involved. Maybe there's going to be so much stuff going on that we're going to find out that, yes, she 100% knows who Batgirl is. And, again, that could make things very complicated and very interesting. Mr. Travers, remember me. (laughs) But you weren't completely honest with me, were you, you naughty snowflake? You didn't tell me you were mean to monkeys. (laughs) Consider this my notice, sir. I call it a happy ending. I rather like monkeys as it happens. I just was chuckling through (laughs) that whole thing. Because it's creepy, it's dark, it's ragdoll, and it was funny. Uh, and that, one of the things I've always appreciated about Gail Simone's writing has been the humor and knowing how to use it appropriately. You can keep people chuckling while not taking away the other emotion. Ragdoll lost nothing there, but it was no. funny. <laughs> It was good. It was good. Oh, God, yeah. He's still Mm -hmm. just this amazing, creepy, nasty villain. Yeah. But you you got those chuckle moments. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm glad we got a chance to do um, three Gail Simone issues on on this particular segment because I'm just loving her writing right now. I'm loving her stuff outside of DC just as much. You know, her Red Sonja stuff is phenomenal. Tomb Raider's great. And uh, I know she's got something coming up on Savage Wolverine. I've got to keep an eye out where that, where that issue is. I'm hoping I, I haven't missed it. Because um, I'm behind on Savage Wolverine because of, obviously, what we do. But uh, she's got an issue coming up on that that I'm really excited for. I try to follow what she's doing. And this is why this issue is a great <laughs> example of why. The, the wrap-up of the movement, the annual with what it did, and then this. Um, just a terrific writer. The use and... I, it's, I love her process of when she knows the creative teams, it's really clear because she tends to write to them, if that makes sense, and partner with them, and the book's better for it. And, and that's an interesting, when somebody embraces comics and how to tell stories in comics, it's really apparent. I think these issues were great examples of just a terrific marriage of great dialogue, great storytelling, great art, uh, just all of it blending together in ways that make sense. There was nothing just jointed which is something that I really quite enjoy about her work and the partnerships that she builds with the people that she works with. And, you know, whether it's through the delivery of her script, the, you know, the understanding of the artist, the relationship with their style of storytelling, uh, this is stuff that I really, really enjoy. And, wow. <laughs> she just rocks. Yes. Holy caffeine! I want to remind everyone about our show website, RagingBullets.com, where you can find news about the show, where things are going. I also want to shout out our Facebook group. We currently share a Facebook group with DCInfinite.com, which is your DC news source. And it's great to have such a wonderful community of people that are talking about everything going on in DC, but also the whole comic book and geek culture genre that we all know and love from sci-fi to blogs that people have to podcasts that are out there just a great opportunity to collaborate and talk about the things that we all know and love it's just a wonderful community so i urge you to join that's separate from our facebook page we have a raging bullets facebook page and a twitter feed both of which feed from our website so those are great ways to find out about the show as well if you prefer to check it out via twitter and facebook we have a google plus page And Jim and I both have personal Facebook pages, and I have a personal Google Plus page. Feel free to add me uh, if you'd like to as well. I love chatting with everybody about the show. I tend to post show news from the Raging Bullets account, but if I'm posting personally, it's always under my account. So if you want to interact with me directly, please feel free to add me. I'd love to have you a part of uh, any of those pages. I would like to remind everyone about our show voicemail line. It's one 440 388-4434 388-4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype and just want to remind everybody that we love having your comments a part of the show feel free to call in about anything DC related there's a lot of cool things coming up 
Once again, sponsoring this episode is DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Remember to check out DCBService.com's Futures and Microsite, where you can pick and choose which books you'd like to order from the 2D or 3D editions of the Future End Specials. Also, I want to remind everyone that DCBService.com is a digital partner. If you do any digital purchasing, please link your accounts with DCBService.com. We actually have a handy link on our website. We can go right to their website. And if you do your purchasing through their site, it doesn't cost you anything more, but you earn 5% of those purchases towards DCB service orders. It's a great way to get something back and to support a show sponsor. Over at InStockTrades.com, they've got the Bad Girl Hardcover Volume 4 Wanted, collecting issues 19 to 25 and the Batman the Dark Knight Ventriloquist 23.1 Special, $24.99 regularly, 50% off only $12.50. The Movement Class Warfare Trade Paperback, collecting issues 1 through 8. This 144-page trade paperback is $14.99 regularly, 42% off, only $8.69. If you haven't checked out this book, I, I think it's pretty easy to tell in this episode how passionate Jim and I were about it. So please consider checking it out. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. Our next episode, we're going to come back a little bit sooner. We had a natural break here, and we are going to come back to talk about Justice League United. We are also going to come back and talk about Secret Origins, Jonah Hex in All-Star Western, and we're going to talk about the Superman Doomsday kickoff with that one shot. So we will see you then. Bye! Flying through space and time, a thousand different lifetimes. Faded for love and flaws and incredibly clear sidelines. Swinging your mace around. Such a practical loud look Helping the JSA And occasionally supporting your own book Hawk man, hawk man Eagle eyes can't see Hawk man, your plan And what you do to me Hawk man are closing in, be they then in guard or Egyptian, working so hard to thwart you and Hawker's mission, the odds are not on your side, and danger seems to stack up, 